We're live. <laughs> Hello? All right, so I guess <laughs> we can get started on the second episode of We the Individuals Live. Um, with me, of course, is uh, fellow We the Individual admins, Andy Catherman, Will Tippins. We have with us today Rocco Stanzione. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Stanzioni. Stanzioni, okay, sorry. I Americanized it there. Um, and then, of course, I, the founder of We the Individuals, Jeff Peterson, and I am, I am uh, Chris Calton. You can also find me under Anna Chris on YouTube, as some of you might know me. Um, and uh, today we're going to be talking about left libertarianism. So before I actually get into some individual insight, Jeff, I, I really want to hear from you on this because I know this is the issue on which uh, you're kind of making a name for yourself in the libertarian community. You really love attacking the left libertarians. You've written a lot of articles about it. Um, so give us your take. What's, what's your beef with left libertarianism? Because even though I agree with pretty much all of your outlooks on it, it I, I, don't, I don't share your passion, I think, or your antipathy towards left libertarianism. So what, what's your gripe with them, Jeff? Uh, there's probably a couple things. Is, uh, um you know, it's, it's probably has something to do with uh, their use of terminology. It's it's very, I think it's very, am, they're very ambiguous. They use tend to use Moton Bailey tactics a lot, equivocation, um, and I think uh, a lot of their terminology is used to smuggle in some very destructive ideas. That's one of them, and then second is really the whole. They seem to have, based off a lot of their propositions and conclusions, they seem to have a lot of disdain for people who have more, who are rich people, be it you know, have, who have more, but just they seem to have a little bit more disdain for those. I'll use the term agency, um, just because they seem to. Can you define that term? Uh, I'd say the the ability to the ability to uh, the ability to actually. Uh, um, Morph the, the your morph your own surroundings, or um, that's probably one of the best ways that I would know how to define it is the the, the ability to um, change the environment to your to change the environment to your will to bend the environment something, to your will. Something that you have more power to do if you do have more capital or more wealth in there. Uh, okay. They have entity. Is that what you're saying? Am I hearing yeah. you right? Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and and we can get into some of the specifics because some of the things you brought up, I actually have in my notes to talk about tonight, so we won't spend too much time on them for now. Just for anybody else who who might be listening, the left when we when we refer to left libertarians, um, we're talking about people that kind of find themselves between the pure libertarian socialist or libertarian communist, and I know a lot of our viewers are going to see those as oxymorons, but historically these, these are grounded ideologies that do have pretty wide followings. Uh, and these are guys that say, well, we're not really capitalists, but we do believe in free trade, and so they, they're kind of, I, I, and this is my perception, they're kind of wishy-washy on these things where I start to agree with them, okay, you're, you're not using the term capitalist, but I agree with your principles, and then they get into some issues that kind of make me uneasy, like, okay, now you're starting to sound like, like a Mikkel Bakunin follower or something like that, so, and that's some of the stuff we're going to dive into, but this is what we're talking about when we talk about the left libertarians, the people that are kind of in the middle between the far-left communist and the far-right Rothbardian camps. Um, I'll get some uh, quick thoughts from the rest of you. Andy, we'll start with you. What, what do you think of left libertarians? These guys bother you like they do, Jeff, or are they not worth worrying about? Um, I think it's... I think I first remember kind of meeting or being introduced to the left libertarian movement, kind of like, um, just like, you know, libertarian, libertarianism per se, it's, it's just not enough. We need to have, like, a libertarian plus plus, to borrow a programming term. Uh, we need to have, like, a, a super-duper libertarianism 2.0 sort of mantra aesthetic. And I, I, don't, I don't really understand why... That's an, it's necessary. I guess this is the, my basic beef: is why is this qualifier necessary? Why is this adjective um, necessary? And okay, again, well, okay. I think it's it's confusing, and it like it it, it 
dry, so if it's if I'm trying to you know be triggered if if anything, I'm triggered because I don't understand what it is that you have to like. You, oh, you're not you're a libertarian? No, 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 no. You have to be a left libertarian. The proper way to center yourself. So that's well, that's my beef with it. Let I guess. me use that. Let me use that as a segue into one of the topics I kind of want to brought up. Uh, I wasn't going to bring it up this early, but you gave me such a good opportunity to. Let's talk about the issue of tradition. So um, I, I actually really enjoy studying anarchist history. And these libertarians, they're, they're pretty much anarchists. I don't know of any that aren't. So we can just as easily call them left anarchists. And the argument that they would make, and, and they would be right in this, is that in the libertarian tradition, uh, they were they were leftists. These guys are, are mutualists. They're early-level socialists. Um, they're, they have some um, issues with private property, but not in the full communist sense. You can own certain things under certain conditions, and they might have different qualifications based on their particular ideology. Um, I know Josiah Warren and uh, Pierre Joseph Proudhon are some of the people that they're going to point to, so they're not full-on communists. But these, these guys did predate by a century or more um, the, the right libertarian. So maybe... Maybe they're right in this in the tradition, um, Rocco. I, I don't know you, so I'm kind of curious. What what are your thoughts on this? Uh, it's it's a little bit all over the map. Uh, I mean, there's, there's left libertarians to be found all over the map. You know, there's your your Charles Johnson uh, doesn't often actually come out and say anything that I disagree with, but you know when he does. And then there's like the Kevin Parsons who can't can't put a, you know, string a couple of sentences together without saying anything <laughs> I disagree with, and then. But I, I think one of my main beefs with them, you know, in addition to the ones Jeff mentioned, are they don't ever seem to actually make propositions. Like you, they they make a claim and they fill it, like you said, with a lot of ambiguous terminology and adjectives that they don't ever seem to be able to define. Even when you ask and then keep asking, uh, you never can get to the bottom of something where two people who started out disagreeing, if you give them the same facts and the same definition, they could, they could agree on what they're looking at. Uh, you're looking at exploitation, for example. Uh, and the same goes like with just about everything they say, like the labor theory of value. You can read Kevin Carson's book and still not know what value means. Uh, and if you ask him to explain it, he'll tell you to read the book. If you ask any of his followers to explain it, read the book, uh, which does you no good. Uh, so those are, those are some of the things that bug me. Okay, I, and I think those are some good points. Um, I think the ambiguity issue is a big one because I, I know a lot of these guys uh, I do admire. Roderick Long, I, I think very highly of the man. He's one of the best anarchist historians. I think alive today is a philosopher for those who don't know him, but um, he, he – um, has translated some of the debates with like Frederick Bastiat and Pierre Joseph Proudhon. But sometimes I'm not sure. Like I, I don't know exactly where he stands in the capitalist versus socialist versus mutualist anarchist. So I, I kind of find myself wondering that when they talk about this stuff. I'm like, I'm not really sure if I agree with you or not. Um, Will, what do you think about all this? Uh, like you said, I really like Roderick Long and. Uh and Sheldon Richmond. There are a couple of guys that, you know, I don't, I wouldn't say that I agree with 100% of everything of, of everything that they say, but I'm sympathetic on one hand because, you know, I'm interested in some of these, uh, some of these issues. You know, I'm, I think most libertarians, even if they consider themselves brutalist or thin libertarians, should, should take interest in these, you know, these types of issues. But it's just, where do you think it to? It was the, uh, Back when I first really got into, you know, uh, sort of getting into the libertarian community, there was that little faction that kept saying, "Well, you know, the check your privilege crowd," and you know, that's that. There's nothing on it prima facie that's incompatible uh, with libertarianism with that, but it sort of brings up an uneasy question if you're talking about what the logical, you know, the, I mean, is, is that going to be, if that doesn't affect the ultimate, you know, the legal philosophy of libertarianism, then I have no problem with it. It's just, yeah, and in fact, I think that it's, you know, it's just aesthetics at that point where, you know, if you're talking about what art a libertarian should like or what, uh, you know, entertainment, anything else, but when, when it does get to the point where it's interfering with the underlying legal philosophy, once again, it's a political, legal, you know, system of belief, uh, maybe I shouldn't phrase it like that, but uh, 
then it becomes really annoying to me. And I, I think the biggest issue is that a lot of people are initially drawn to uh, something like left libertarianism because it sounds edgy, but really they sort of lose substance and get lost in what you know a lot of the uh, sort of sensationalist uh, things that are more associated with with progressivism. And that's when it is a problem, I think. Sure. Rocco, I'm going to go back to you now because you uh, you touched on a point that I kind of have on my list as well, and that's kind of the subjectivity of definitions or these ambiguous terms. Jeff mentioned it as well. I'm going to get to his thoughts, of course, too. Um, but I, I have some here, and I kind of – I wouldn't mind just seeing if you give me a – uh, a good idea of what I should think about this. So I, before we started, I wrote down social justice. That's when we hear, and even just the word justice in general, I find to be a relatively ambiguous term. But we like this social qualifier of social justice. Um, we like the word equality in any faction of leftism, including uh, left libertarianism. Uh, you mentioned exploitation. I didn't think of that one until you said it, but I wrote it down here. Um, what's it, are, are these words that have any meaning to us? Like, should we, as we might consider ourselves right libertarians, should we care about these words at all? Uh, well, I wouldn't characterize myself, at least, as a, as a right libertarian. I just okay, Forgive me if I got ahead of myself, then. Uh is the question, should we uh, adopt or deal with these terms? Is that what you're... Uh, well, yeah. Like I, I tend to avoid talking about social justice and equality and exploitation. But then I think, uh, you know, I, I care about justice. I care about equality as, as I understand them. But when the leftists are talking about them, I find myself going, wait, 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 I don't, I don't agree with that. Like when you're talking about equality, somebody brings up like um, inequality, the disparate pay between uh, men and women. I'm like, well, there's, there's a lot more to it than that. So I, I'm, I'm always wondering how I should approach these terms. Yes, as bromides, I'm going to agree with them, but we have to define them first, and I never can seem to come to a consensus on that with a left libertarian. Yeah, good. Good luck with that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, social justice. Nobody has yet been able to tell me what that means again. Uh, mm -hmm. But you can't. I think because of the way they define terms, or 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 go out of the way not to. Um, you can't actually make. You can't uh, critique any of their claims because they haven't actually made any claims. They've said some stuff, uh, and anything you say about it. Uh, is a straw man because that's not actually what they said, and you can't get to the bottom of what they are saying because of these these this lack of definition. Would you would would it be fair then to say, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, so tell me if I'm getting this wrong, that they are being intentionally ambiguous for that, like as a defense mechanism in their arguments? That's a really good question. Uh, I haven't made up my mind about that. I I really think that they're sincere in their beliefs and in the and in the way that they are expressing them. Uh, and, but it's, you know, it's, it's all very muddled, as sincere as it might be, you know, I, I think maybe one thing that draws a lot of people to liberty, I think this is why there's so many programmers among libertarians, is that there's a, it's the simplicity and conciseness and consistency uh, that it appeals to, I don't know, a certain kind of mind or personality, and those are not the kinds of minds or personalities that I find so much on the, on the left. Uh, you know, there's a lot of you, 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 so much going on in, in one concept, uh, and then they you know wrap a term around it and they use it. Uh, capitalism, for example, you know, what do they mean by capitalism? Sure. Uh, well, my goodness, <laughs> the, you know, they they write some pretty long on what they mean by capitalism, and you still don't know. Um, sure. Okay. Well. Uh, Jeff, that let, let's move on from there then, because capitalism is another another one of the things. Jeff, you've written an article on this exact topic. They avoid the term um, capitalism. They say, I, I think what uh, I can't remember who wrote it. Is it Chartier wrote a book, um, uh, Freed Markets, Anti-Capitalism, or something like that. Yeah, this is your area of expertise, yeah. so yeah. I want to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, well, I think uh, with the way that the libertarian left uses the term is actually uh, intellectually dishonest and you know I'll concede that the term does have some baggage and to many people represents everything bad with the economy you now including left libertarians you know you'll hear professors media politicians and so on use the term to describe what is corporatism uh, to many libertarians or invoke the 
historical definition. Um, but I think that I, I'd like to touch a couple base uh, a couple points on that. Um, you know, first of all, many other terms that libertarians use have the same problem. I was I was watching a video with le left libertarian philosopher Charles Johnson, in uh, which he was actually describing anarchism, and he was talking to the crowd and asking them, you know, what comes to mind when people think of anarchism, and uh, you know, he brought up images of chaos and so on. So, however, he would still def defend this term anarchism if need be. Furthermore, historically, negative connotations come to mind when people think of the term free market, libertarian, and privatizations, but I don't see the libertarian left suggesting that we uh, should do away with any of those terms anywhere to the extent as capitalism. So, um, And many of the uh, articles uh, I've read about them suggesting it should be dropped, very few of them any, have any mention of the, de, of the definition private ownership of a means of production. They use, like Rocco said, very ambiguous definitions that is, can be plausibly attacked. And what's even worse is that in their articles they argue that you know, free market is not the same as capitalism when defined as corporatism and that they should embrace free market ca anti-capitalism, which I think allows them to smuggle in a number of Trojan horse concepts. So I you know, the last point is, you know, the term does get perverted, misused, and distorted by advocates of the state. You know, I know what I mean, but others might not. So, you know, at one point I said perhaps call myself a market anarchist instead of an anarcho-capitalist or embracing anti-capitalism is a good idea, but then sometime later in socialism, what it means by Tucker, he has the same thought, yet this time it's, this time it's about socialism, and his conclusion is completely contradictory to the conclusion of capitalism, or his definition is that he responds to a fictional character who associates the word socialism with all things bad, but to me that's like a double standard, because uh, on one hand, you know, as, as far as on, on one hand, you oppose capitalism for its supposed association with corporatism, yet you take pride in socialism, even though you are forced to emphasize over and over and over you don't mean state socialism. So I think it's a double standard. I think those who abuse socialism cannot have a monopoly on the term socialism, rightfully so, and neither those who uh, libertarian, left libertarians and uh, l those who oppose capitalism for the same reason. So I think it's intellectually dishonest how they use it. Okay, and I want to correct what I said earlier. Uh, the book by Kevin Chartier is Markets, Not Capitalism. So I just had to look it up real quick just to make sure that I didn't mis misrepresent his book. The subtitle is Individualist Anarchism Against Bosses, Inequality, Corporate Power, and Structural Poverty. So that kind of goes into some of the ambiguity um, we, were, uh, we were talking about. It's got the word inequality in there, of course, and we're against corporate power. One thing, Andy, I'll hear from you on this. Um, uh, when I know Pierre Joseph Proudhon, um, super interesting guy. I love I love looking into his history. And one of the things he believed is uh, he he's famous as Benjamin Tucker reminds us for the phrase um, property is robbery. But he also said property is liberty. And he actually made a distinction between the different types of property. And his distinction was how we could define free markets and anti capitalism theoretically, um, which is that he didn't believe in uh, the exclusive right to capital property, property that you use to actually make consumer goods. In other words, if I owned a sewing machine, I couldn't tell somebody not to use it, um, but I owned my shirt, you know, and so there, there was some mm -hmm. level of property rights there under, under Proudhon's uh, ideas, but he believed in this concept known as usufruct, which means that you can't tell somebody not to, if you have a well, you can't exclude somebody from coming and getting water out of the well. Is that, I mean, this sounds maybe a little bit reasonable, right? We can still have free trade, we can still make goods, we're just not saying, I own this, you can't touch it. Why wouldn't this work, Andy? Well, I'll just give you a good example. So, um, so I live in a house, and I, I you know, own it, I might have a mortgage on it, but let's say that my wife and I we want to open up so this is our house, right? So we could sell sure. it. You know, we could do whatever we want with it. Um, but what if we want to use it as a daycare? Or sure. what if I want to um, build a big barn outside and then start farming it so it becomes a business? Sure. I don't live on a farm, but you know, I'm from Iowa, so you know, work with me here. So you know, it 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 muddles the the the. the when you can't use, like, you can't have property that's going to be like a producer good or a capital good, that's a problem. 
um, when it comes to you know capitalism because that's that's what's um, you know with the industrial revolution or whatever that is what really you can see all of these different things from a historical standpoint uh, where uh, wealth was just um, expl wealth and like prosperity kind of started just growing exponentially once people were able to own the means of production when it comes to capital goods and you had investment in those capital goods and then you had you know um, uh, a stock like another good example would be uh, what what would the left libertarians think of or Proudhon think about a stock market and that was one thing that Mises said uh, in his term of socialism, which is like the state owning the means of production and whatnot, what what would prevent a a, a socialist society from ever forming or whatever, be, becoming a, a somewhat free society? And, and he said a stock market. So I think to your specific question, like you you can't just say hey you can use that house just to live in, but you can't use it as a business. Um, and, and so like that's that's my my most uh, simple example I hope kind of resonates with most people that can kind of understand that concept and how important it is to have property rights and not only those consumer goods we have, shoes, socks, food, whatever, clothing, but as well as those things, those tools, those different um, means of production that we can use to um, sell goods uh, on the market. So, so and I, again, I just always want to clarify that I'm hearing everybody correctly. Um, if I were to put this simply, you're saying that if we couldn't exclude people from using capital goods, we wouldn't have the incentive to invest in them initially. Sure. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. That that makes sense. Well, one of the things you brought up on the house, I'll go to Will from this, but then I, I do want to hear from uh, Jeff as well because I know this is one of his uh, pet topics uh, too. But Will, um, speaking from Andy, he mentioned living in his house. And that reminded me of the occupancy and use argument. Uh, for the viewers who might not be familiar with this theory, this is the theory that, yes, you can own what you have as long as you're using it. So another mutualist, an individual anarchist, one of my favorites, I'm actually uh, working on some research for him right now, is, um, uh, oh, my God, I forget his name, the, uh, Josiah Warren. There, I had a brain fart there for a second. Josiah Warren was very similar to Proudhon, but developed the ideas independently and prior to Proudhon. He actually did believe in the private ownership of capital goods, so he was a little bit closer to the capitalist, but he refused to own anything unless he was putting it to productive use. And so this is kind of where you get this idea of occupancy and use. It's mine as long as I'm using it, but if I abandon it, it's free for somebody else to come in and start using it. And so this would be like in a house. Like, What is the statute of limitations for which I can be away from my house um, before it's no longer mine. So, w w what's your take on this idea of occupancy and use? So, yeah, the question is absentee ownership, right? And so, right. Really, if you if you uh, you can approach it most the easiest way to approach it is just from a practical utilitarian standpoint, which you know I don't I don't prefer that, but it's much simpler. I mean, if you said that there's no absentee ownership, then that essentially I mean, that throws into disarray every other type of social organization that revolves around property, which is to say basically all of society. And civilization, in my opinion, would cease to really uh, function. I mean, without that's that's pretty fundamental. And uh, I know I know Jeff, I know Jeff is uh, chomping at the bit for for this one, or so. You want to pass it over? Yeah, I'm going to make it a little bit more difficult for Jeff. Have... <laughs> okay, Jeff, I, I'm going to I'm going to knock this up a notch because I think it's easy to get into this degree of like, what if I go into vacation and then is it not mine? Can somebody get it? And I, and I think most of them are going to say, but even Rothbard, when he talks about homesteading, he talks about the abandonment of property. So there's still a degree to which like. If I abandon my property, somebody else can come in at homestead. So where do we draw? Like, when does it stop being this hard to define occupancy and use uh, definition and the actual abandonment of property that Rothbard uh, uh, talked about when he talked about homesteading property? W w what's your answer? I think when it comes to abandonment, and I think some uh, might disagree with me here that I don't think that a time frame can be logically derived. I think it's either left up to a case-by-case -case basis like the courts um, or depends less on time and more on whether a previous owner asserts his rights 
against squatters. Um, property can be considered abandoned if the previous owner makes no effort to challenge squatters. That's typically uh, what my answer would be is is um, is uh, when you know it, it can be considered abandonment. I, and I think uh, one thing I want to touch base on with uh, as far as uh, occupancy and use, as far as that, I think I think there's only one kind of ownership, and that's really the exclusive right to control a resource. And I think that occupancy and use is just going to confuse or conflate ownership with possession, for instance, which eliminates ownership as a concept distinct from possession. Um, but I think uh, as far as um, um, when it comes to occupancy and use, I think they want some sort of abandonment theory in between, you know, he took my car when I wasn't looking and lock, locks relatively high bar, but they're never specific. I think that such a system based on possession needs to have some sort of um, exception between, you know, beyond immediate control, you know, something that lets me keep my house if I, you know, from going to work or anything like that. And, um, but yeah, I think uh, as far as the occupancy and uses, I think the only way to, uh, to know for sure is if the person who has a valid claim doesn't seek to enforce it or says they abandon it or simply dies without heirs. So, okay, yeah, I, you know, I, I like that answer, and I, I didn't actually think of that, um, but it reminds me of another one of the Center for Stateless Society guys that actually, I think, wrote a chapter for one of their books. John Hasness uh, is a libertarian thinker who talks a ton about the private adjudication of disputes, the private court systems, and the um, uh, the the tort system that would crop up in this. So I think that is a good way to define it, where maybe there is some level of subjectivity in either systems, uh, but we're going to file disputes to claim property rights, and then whatever adjudication system uh, it crops up through the spontaneous order would would handle that. Mm -hmm. That's an argument. I, I I wish we had a left libertarian on here because I'd want to hear from them because that's a that's one of their guys who writes about these tort systems in their books. But he always is, he's another one of my favorite thinkers. He always comes across as a, a strong private property guy. Um, we'll move on from there because I do want to talk about hierarchy, Rocco. I'm going to come back to you. This is another thing I hear from left libertarians. In fact, in one of my old, old YouTube videos where me and uh, another libertarian friend of mine are debating against socialists, I still get comments on it. And just this morning, I got one saying that anarchists have to believe uh, or they have to be against hierarchies. And I kind of said, well... I, I'm not so sure about that. What do you think? Do we have to be against hierarchies, Rocco? Well, uh, I, I guess I'm, I'm I'm a little bit curious what they mean because I what I think they really mean is uh, like the org chart, you know, the hierarchical arrangement of the org chart uh, plus the hierarchical organization of the state. I think they've, you know, found a superficial similarity between a corporation and the state that says okay, this is what we're really against, since we're against both of these things. Uh, but an org chart also looks a lot like my family tree, and I don't see any reason to <laughs> object to that. Uh, so no, I, don't, I really, really don't think so. Okay. Um, Jeff, I'm going to go back to you, because I want to hear your take on this. Uh, what about, uh, is there a distinction that can be made between state hierarchies and say business or corporate hierarchies. When I when I enter into employment, am I submitting myself to hierarchy that, as an anarchist, I should oppose? Oh no, not necessarily. I, I think that uh, I think you know one thing that the le libertarian left may have, and I can concede to, is that you know the state state puts up uh, barriers to entry, which makes it very difficult for me to start a business or even people. Um, go to work so in a way that they're right but I think that uh, they're focusing on more of a and that's that's a symptom of a symptom of the problem is by uh, removing the state then that's no longer a problem but I think that they uh, I think when it comes to hierarchy they uh, it, 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 it seems that they want to uh, um, when it comes to hierarchy you know the job you know the, if I want to buy or work you know, a state has power. They can say, you know, if you don't do what I say, I will throw you in a cage. And this, and then with the hierarchy from employment, you know, I can choose not to actually, I can choose not to actually be employed. They won't throw me in a cage for doing so. Um, you know, so it's 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 
if I don't do what they say, it's it's their loss or my loss, whichever. It's it's. So I think it's uh I think that they uh use uh they try to make a hierarchy of the state similar to a hierarchy of uh of actually uh, businesses. It, was, it reminds me of uh, what St Stephen Kinsella he wrote about um you know how uh how left libertarians will be in a discussion with you and they say well surely you can't be against your you're against uh you think some other components are important to libertarianism right and then and then it says okay well libertarianism is more about aggression it's more about you know uh pushing people around you don't think you should push people around right and obviously you you can't be for uh bossing your employees around right so they kind of seem to try and uh Make a statism the same as a hierarchy in, in a business. So, I think that a comparison that left libertarians make is absurd. Right. So it it's a distinction between voluntary hierarchy, and that's something again. Josiah Warren, another mutualist, people point to him as an example of left libertarianism, and he actually spoke. I think in his writing, equitable equitable commerce, if I remember, he spoke about voluntary hierarchies, and he was completely okay with them. So even even on the the left uh, libertarian um, historiography, there we do see some some friendliness to hierarchies. Uh, but I I'm just kind of curious as to how the modern guys think about it because you read them a little bit more than me. I want to move on since we're getting close to the end of this and talk about um, first the issue of thick versus thin libertarians. This is another one that kind of hits home to me because I know the thick libertarians these are the incredibly dogmatic the cultural libertarians. Many of them say, well, you need to be atheist. It goes back to kind of the hierarchy thing we were just talking about. I cannot be a thick libertarian because I'm not an atheist. I'm not an agnostic. I believe in God. Um, in, but there's, I think, a lot more to this um, in terms of just like the cultural beliefs. It almost reminds me of Ayn Rand's objectivism. She was kind of libertarian, but then she also said you needed to listen to this kind of music and you needed to watch these kind of plays and be into this kind of art and drink this kind of wine or whatever absurdities it was. Will, Thick libertarian, thin libertarianism, go. <laughs> well, <laughs> that reminds me of a uh, a good quote that I think pretty much summarized the entire uh, the the entire debate, and I think it was actually uh, directed towards one of one of Jeff's favorite people. I'm, I won't say her name, but uh, so it went. <laughs> <laughs> I will. Kat, Kathy Risen Whites is who you're referring to. It went, to be Christian, you need to believe in Jesus Christ. However, loyalty to the Pope is a part of a school within Christianity, but not essential to being a Christian. Adding opposition to hierarchy as being essential to libertarianism is like saying all real Christians must believe in the Pope. It's descriptively wrong and a terrible prescription that defines people out of Christianity. So I think that pretty much, I mean, I think that pretty much tells the whole story. If uh, And of course, you know, I, you, Jeff, you've talked a lot about Intrius and, uh, you know, you know, if you think that's part of the plan with with those who do try to define certain, uh, you know, the the brutalist, so-called brutalist, out of libertarianism, you know, that that might have a little bit to uh, to do with that. But no, I, I think uh, thick, thin. I mean, someone like Roderick Long calling himself a uh, a thick libertarian versus Walter Block calling himself a thin libertarian. I think they're both good libertarians. It just really matters about your underlying principles more than. Uh, you know those uh -huh. so. right. I'm okay with Roderick Long calling himself a thick libertarian if that means like I also I'm I'm a no gods no masters guy. That's fine. Just as long as you don't think that's a qualifier for libertarian. Well, I, I know I, a lot of my like Tom Woods is one of my favorite libertarians. He's Catholic, right? I, mean, I, I never even uh, the uh, the fact that this the analogy had to do with Christian. I'd never heard someone say that you have to be an atheist to be a libertarian. Yeah, I've never heard that either. Uh, I, I well I, I know I do hear it among, among I, I read a lot of these socialist anarchists and, and I know a lot of them say it. I may be speaking out of turn for some of the the mutualist free to market guys that we're discussing, but I know the, the one of the anarchy flags literally says no gods, no masters. You know, so it is something that is very dogmatic among the socialists. I think as we move farther to the right we, we do move away from them and I think that's a good thing. I think that's a big positive. Sorry, I was going to say that. I think that's more of just a general rebellious attitude, which in a way is is admirable. But uh, you know, I don't think that that is by any means a requisite. I think you know all that. Even Walter Block, who is an atheist, uh, you know, says that Christianity is perfectly compatible. In fact, I mean, I think if someone were to be a true Christian, they would pretty much have to be 
you know, a, uh, some sort of voluntarist or anarchist. So that's just that's that's the argument I make, but that's a different episode. Yeah. Um, okay, well, I'm glad you brought up Ka Kathy Re Reisenwitz because she uh, uh, is a good example <laughs> of the. Uh, <laughs> she's a good example of the next point I was going to ask about. I'll go to Andy for this because we haven't heard from you in a few. Andy, you, oh, okay, your your connection's doing a little better now. Um, Kathy, one of the things she says is when she's talking about these leftist issues um, like gender equality and things of this nature that that social justice. Uh, one of the arguments that she makes, and a lot of people agree with her, is that it's a marketing thing. It's a way that we can reach out to the the, the political left, the Democrats, and the, this is a ripe group to bring into libertarianism. A lot of Democrats became Ron Paul supporters and things of this nature. So sure. is this not just a, a valid marketing concept? Maybe there's some value to this. What do you think? So yeah, so to segue off your last point about thickism, uh, it, it, it goes to the point about... Um, their, their thickism through strategy. So that's one of their, their things. Is And I think that's really the primary reason that these uh, left libertarians are kind of um, where they're at and they come come from where they are. Is It's really strategy. And uh, I do agree that, you know, there's plenty of... The one thing, like, uh, that Ron Paul came... Why he was so effective is that he was able to build coalitions of, of different diverse types of people. You know, people with, you know... Um, the the hedge funds guys, whereas whereas like the pot smoking hippie guys, you know, and there's nothing wrong with with uh, appeal, trying to appeal to you know a broad base, uh, a big camp, but I think when it comes to the left libertarians, is that they th their their strategy is kind of like it, it it morphs from trying to reach as many of these people to therefore everybody needs to be of the left or needs to go to the I don't I kind of disagree with this whole distinction of of left and right with regards to being a qual-libertarianism, qual-libertarian, but um, I, I don't I don't really think that it's it's absolutely necessary. I mean, sure, there's plenty of ways to reach different sorts of people, and that's the, the best thing about libertarianism is that it's like this common denominator that everybody can agree to and that it's got a really, really logical, coherent, um, just it makes sense, common sense uh, appeal. And it will appeal to lots of people, but that doesn't necessarily mean that. Therefore, once we got all these people in the camp, they have to go and believe all of these different things that are not necessarily connected or relevant to to libertarianism. Okay, Jeff, I want to get a quick word in from you about the marketing um, question, just because I, I I like your opinion on this stuff, and then I'm going to move on to my last topic that I want to hear from everybody on. So, Jeff, uh, the marketing points. Are these tactics that we maybe uh, don't like, um, are they valid to bring people in from like the Democrat side of the political spectrum into libertarianism? What's the, what's the harm in this? Um, I think if you're going to use uh, using social justice as an example, I'm going to probably have to you know, go back to what Rocco said. We would need to have a clear definition of what it means in order to you know, use a strategy like that to attract others. Um, I wrote I wrote about Kathy Reisenwitz uh, earlier this year, surprisingly, and um, this uh, I remember saying uh, you know maybe maybe she's maybe she's right about all these maybe she's right about everything she says. Um, the thing is is that I think that we need to filter out bad ideas with good ideas because um, just because something may be typically leftist doesn't mean it's also necessarily libertarian because you know left libertarians will also like to invoke tradition a lot and you know I think uh, just because something is leftist doesn't mean it's necessarily li libertarianist um, but I think that uh, Ron Paul had a better strategy and I think Walter Block or Lou Rockwell may have said something about when Ron Paul was actually becoming you know when he had his revolution in 2008 and 2012 he brought people with the common sense things such as war, the debt, the Federal Reserve, and those were what I would argue just as uh, Lou or Walter, I think it was Lou Rockwell, that those are actually thin concepts because those are all common common sense things and as, as Andy pointed out, but I also think that once you're there, once you figure out the, um, once you figure out the actual uh, you know, once you figure out you're a libertarian, then from there you can adopt your own values. But I don't think that necessarily uh, trying to attract people with things such as 
social justice or checking your privilege is going to be at all any, any constructive because you're just going to put people, libertarians, against each other. And I think that's a lot of what the left libertarian has done is uh, put people like left libertarians against other libertarians who, you know, uh, I think it's just going to divide libertarianism even more by using that strategy. Okay. Okay, well, let's move on to the last question, and I want to hear from everybody. Rocco, I'm going to start with you, which is, um, can, and I, I, let me qualify this first. So, in the historic libertarian tradition, Pierre Joseph Proudhon, Frederick Bastiat, hero of these mutualists, hero of those of us on the Rothbardian side, they were both part of the French Parliament at the same time. They both uh, were seated on the left side of parliament, which is one of the arguments you hear from the leftists saying all libertarianism, left libertarianism, this is their argument. And it's true. Frederick Bastiat and Pierre Joseph Proudhon, they disagreed vehemently on issues of basically capitalism versus socialism. Um, they, they disagreed on interest and usury. They disagreed on so many issues, but they also voted on the same side in parliament many, many times. So they agreed and they worked together on many things. Um, can we not do the same with the left libertarians? Say we, we disagree with you on maybe your views on capital, um, but we're anti-war. We're anti-war on drugs, and these are important issues. What do you think? Can we work together? Uh, I don't know what it would mean to work together because we can't do the analogous thing. We're not going to go vote together, uh, right? So if it's uh, can we try to uh, you know engage in the same kind of marketing efforts? Maybe not toward the same audiences. I, I don't know about that. Uh, if it's, uh, work toward the same you know post-state solutions, uh, maybe not the same solutions. Maybe different solutions. Uh, if they want to build uh, worker-owned collectives as well. We build uh, something resembling a corporation. Uh, I mean, I think we can get along just fine, but I, I don't actually know what it would mean for us to do there in that sense. I don't know of the analog to uh, Proudhon and, and Bastiat, uh, you know, voting the same way on the same issues. I'll give you I'll give you some examples, and I'll move on to a will for the next thought. But some of the stuff that comes to mind is like antiwar.com. Antiwar.com is run by people who describe themselves as Rothbardians, but they're they're speaking a message that would reach out to left libertarians, which is an anti-war message. It reminds me too of uh, the anthology by uh, uh, that Tom Woods. And I can't remember the other guy, but Tom Woods and a socialist compiled. Um, about uh, basically anti-war writing. So w when it comes to issues of war, um, when it comes to issues of the the uh, the war on drugs or the militarization of the police, on these single issues, um, could we not say ally ourselves at least to tackle maybe just legalizing marijuana? Will, what do you think? Oh, absolutely. And I mean that left so-called left libertarians and you know no name, no prefix libertarians and right libertarians whatever you want to call yourself, we should all have very common grounds. I mean, anti-war, anti-war on drugs, anti, well, you know, there are a couple of libertarians who have made living wage arguments as, you know, but if you can do that without the state, you know, without what we have agreed is our uh, immoral means to the ends, then I have no problem with it. And there is a lot more binding us together than, you know, than, than we disagree about. I mean, it's it's so it's so touchy, you know. You have people who disagree over Rand Paul. Who it's all it's there's so many rifts. It's almost just uh, it's almost petty at this point. I just don't know why you can't just look at the bigger picture. And to me, the biggest issue is is foreign intervention, foreign interventionism. And so if we can have that one thing, then like antiwar.com, you know, uh, and you know there are just there's so many so many issues that, that there should be. Uh, complete agreement on, so I don't know why not. Other than just the you know the pride and uh, people just looking for reasons to to pick at each other, essentially. Sure. Okay, Andy. Final thoughts, man. Should we put our dogma aside and find things uh, to work with left libertarians on? Yeah, I think it, the the main issue here is the common common core that we should all agree to, whatever we call ourselves. Left libertarians, uh, you know, up libertarians, down libertarians, right libertarians, whatever you want to um, coordinate yourself um, triangularly or rectangularly, um, is aggression. It's about aggression. It's it's the the core thing of libertarianism. It has nothing to do with uh, 
anything else. The people that the, the thing that makes you know Roderick Long and Charles Johnson and uh, Sheldon Richmond great libertarians is they're libertarian. So uh, that's that's the key thing that I I would you know coordinate with them on and 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 completely agree with them on. Also, you know whether their their grasp of economics. I think uh, my experience is that a lot of those folks that um, identify themselves as left libertarians maybe don't have a full understanding of Austrian economics, and I think that's their their downfall. Is uh, is you know it's a it's not a prescriptive science; it's a descriptive science of, of facts of what what is in the real world. So yeah, I mean uh, for those those that have a sound grounding in, in economics, I, I and especially like epistemology and philosophy. Um, I I have a lot of respect for Roderick Long and some of those um, some of his uh, Mises U talks on uh, on positivism and those sorts of things. So absolutely, if if we want to try to um, you know libertarians of the world unite, you know it's going to be on those sorts of things. Sure. Okay, um, Jeff. We'll, uh, we'll end with you. Are we ever going to see you and Kathy Reisenweitz linking arms and marching for the same cause? Well, uh, I mean, I'll use that as a, I'll, I'll take that as a, do we think, do I think we'll ever be allies? And, and really, I'll, I'll go, I'll, I'll kind of have to go agree with Andy and, and Rocco and Will. I'd love to see us work together. However, it's hard for me to imagine because, you know, and the reason why is for me, I, I want to, I don't want to end the state, but the libertarian left to me, I, I don't. I'm not really too sure that's their end goal. You know, whenever I'm, whenever I talk to left libertarians, when presented with choosing between fighting the evils of the state, you know, a monopoly on coercive power that historically and currently engages in atrocities on a grand scale, and railing against jokes found to be offensive, perceived discrimination, cultural traditions found to be discomforting, or uh, people with more privilege, they tend to go after the latter, and furthermore, they do it in a, this group has it worse than that one uh, manner, instead of pointing out injustices in all cases. So, um, I think, you know, if the state ends tomorrow, the difference between uh, me and a left libertarian is that when it, what comes down to it after that, you know, if, if let's say that we press a button, the state ends, I'll look around and observe a per some percentage of people still having the same norms and uh, types of social preferences and I'll move on with my own life but a left libertarian may look around and still find you know something to object to you know something that needs to be fixed such as bosses or people with privileges and so on and I'm convinced that the left is more interested in harming those with with more than they are aiding those with less and I and I think that they see helping the poor as a, an excuse to harm rich people or people with more, just because look at who they hate. They hate bosses, people with money, white men, or anybody with more than average, and who do they love and who do they identify with? It's it's those with less, and basically anyone that claims victimhood, and if you, you know, if you look at their writings on privilege, occupancy and use, social justice, hierarchy, plus, you know, capitalism, those topics share a, a common trait, which is someone has more than someone else, and those with more automatically are right. suspects. So, so. Um, I think, uh, and I'll, I'll end with this, I think that um, one thing that I wanted to say as far as, uh, as, far as li left libertarians, I, I think, you know, um, when it comes to them, I think I'd, I'd prefer that they were to be called, um, you know, I, I, I would prefer that they would be called actually humanitarians or egalitarians. And I say that because... Um, Mil uh, Murray Rothbard actually said, "Scratch an egalitarian, and you'll inv inevitably find a statist." Yeah. And um, and regarding humanitarians, Rothbard also wrote about Isabel Patterson in *The God of the Machine*, where she spoke of the humanitarian with the guillotine. And in one second, I have it pulled up here. The humanitarian, Mrs. Patterson wrote, wishes to be a prime mover in the lives of others. He cannot admit either the divine or the natural order by which men have the power. To help themselves, uh, humanitarian puts himself in the place of God. But Mrs. Patterson notes the humanitarian is confronted by two awkward facts: first, that the competent do not need his assistance, and second, that the majority of people, if unperverted, positively do not want to be done good by the humanitarian. 
So having considered what the good of others might be and who was to decide on the good and what to do about it, Mrs. Patterson points out, of course, what the humanitarian actually proposes is that he shall do what he thinks is good for everybody. It is at this point that the humanitarian sets up the guillotine. Hence, she concludes, the humanitarian, in theory, is the terrorist in action. So I, I think that being said, is as much as I would love for us to find common ground in the state, I don't think that they, once the state's gone, that's what they'll be satisfied. They'll keep going after a boogeyman that, who has more than someone else. All right, so we've got some yeses and we've got some reservations, and I think that's fair. I'll give my quick take on it, and then we're going to end the show. Um, uh, I've always said um, I, I don't agree with Voltarine declares uh, maxim anarchy without adjectives. I like the idea of it being like we're all anarchists, but I like the adjectives. because Voltarine declare is an early uh, uh, 19th century American anarchist, for those who don't know. Um, I like the adjectives because when I say I'm an anarcho-capitalist, the anarcho describes what I advocate, and the capitalist describes what I predict will come of that. So I advocate anarchy. I think that will lead to capitalism. I'm okay with it if I'm wrong. As long as a left libertarian, and I would say this for the socialist anarchist, the communist anarchist, as long as that's how they view it, I advocate an uh, anarchy, and if I'm wrong in what I predict, the hyphenate, uh, then, then I'm comfortable with it. Then I say I can work with you because our priority is ending the state. And I think that goes back to what you're saying, Jeff. It's really a matter of priorities. I think we would all agree with that, and the priority should always be ending the state. All right, so that's going to be it for tonight. We will be back next week, and uh, then we should actually be doing live sessions that people can uh, watch as we're talking and comment um, during the show. Um, but until then, uh, you can always comment and let us know what you think. Give us topic ideas, and we'll see you then.